Earlier this month, a Newsnight investigation found ambulances waiting for hour upon hour outside hospitals with patients in the back. We were told hospitals, unable to discharge recovering patients into the community and get A&E patients onto the wards, are using ambulances, in effect, as an overflow waiting room. We've since been in contact with emergency care and ambulance staff up and down the country, and they paint a disturbing picture of a service unable and struggling to cope. We stayed in touch with three of them across their shifts to help us understand in real time the stresses and strains on this most crucial of public services. These three members of staff don't know each other and we've hidden their identities. Paula works on ambulances in the northwest. Reg has worked for the service in the West Midlands for more than a decade. And Kim is a 999 call handler in London. We kept in touch with each on different days over a single week, but have brought together what they told us to build a typical picture of what one shift on the front line looks like right now. Reg is starting his shift at 7 a.m. There are already more than 250 jobs. That's more than 250 999 calls waiting for an ambulance. Experienced paramedics have told us that this is far from usual. In normal times, you'd expect the night team to have cleared the queue by morning. In just a couple of hours, the backlog has actually grown by over 100 jobs. It's just so incredibly demoralising starting a day knowing that there are already hundreds of people waiting for the ambulance, some for over 24 hours. By 2 p.m., Reg's ambulance is waiting outside A&E with an elderly patient in the back. And it's a typical story. There's nowhere else for the patient to go. So far, we have been sat on the truck for an hour waiting. No beds in A&E. There is nowhere else for them to go. Another bed blocked. Not because they need medical care, but because there simply isn't anywhere else for them to go. They'll be stuck outside A&E with a patient who doesn't need A&E for the rest of the afternoon. And all the while, the crew and the patient will hear the calls coming through from those whose situations are far more dire. There are approximately 85 Category 2 calls waiting to be answered, with the longest wait more than four hours. Waits like this, while happening regularly, are still above the average and still double the national target across the UK. And the figures are going in the wrong direction. According to the latest ambulance statistics, the average response time nationally for these type of emergencies shot up last month from around 40 minutes to over 50 minutes. Listening to call outs for jobs that can't be covered whilst delayed at hospital is disturbing for everyone, including the patients we're looking after. They hear the call outs too and it makes them feel guilty for calling us. And there's a knock-on effect to all this, which is also causing unnecessary harm. I know that patients have made the decision not to go to A&E because they know, they know that the wait is going to be ridiculous. And some of those patients absolutely need to go. And we end up going out later to find that the patient has either died or deteriorated drastically. At the end of her shift in the northwest, Paula has one last call to deal with. An elderly patient has been waiting for an ambulance for more than 10 hours. They seemed initially OK, but as time passes, they're deteriorating and the family are getting worried. They've called 999 again and again. It was like they had severe dementia all of a sudden. We blue-lighted the patient to the hospital, but there was no space for us, so we had to go in the corridor. They should have been in hospital by 6am this morning. Even if the patient had been in hospital earlier, it could have still happened and the prognosis could still be the same. But whatever caused it hasn't been treated in a timely fashion. We don't know the patient's fate. In London, Kim is starting her overnight shift in a 999 control centre. There are already 300 incidents waiting for an ambulance. 150 of them are Category 2 emergency responses meant to be sent on within 18 minutes, but the oldest is almost seven hours. I've got 50 calls on my screen to deal with. There are 40 call handlers in and 10 waiting to be answered. In the middle of the night, it's looking dangerous for those facing an emergency. Call handling is even worse again. 25 call handlers in, 25 calls waiting to be answered. It's taking five minutes to get through to 999. Delays like this are really dangerous, especially on 999 calls. 
any of those 25 calls could be someone not breathing. By the end of the night, they've managed to get on top of the calls with fewer than 50 jobs still waiting for an ambulance. This is as good as it gets, Kim says. She says holding jobs isn't unusual as it allows the service to keep ambulances back for the most life-threatening emergencies. That's how it's meant to work. So holding jobs isn't in itself a bad thing, but what we're seeing at the moment is holding emergency and even some critical calls for far, far longer than they were ever meant to be. The more we hold, the worse the consequences. It's not uncommon to see a job that started as a cat too come back in a few hours later and the patient has stopped breathing. Do not move her unless she's in danger. In the control centres, as in the ambulances and in hospitals, the issues are familiar ones. Recruitment, retention, hospital and social care capacity and handover delays. For emergency care staff and of course patients, some of whom are facing life or death, it's solutions they need.